Okay, Tim, sit down. It's time to start. <laughs> We're all waiting on you, bro. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. It's a beautiful day. It's good to see each and every one of you here this morning. We're going to worship and have a great time of friendship and fellowship all together. Just a couple of things coming up. Monday the 9th of August. That's a week from tomorrow. Uh, will be our board meetings. You can see September 11th, we are planning to have a huge yard sale. Now, if you don't bring anything else, folks, don't, don't bring anything else. We have enough stuff. Uh, and I can tell you this, what is not sold is going to the rescue mission. Uh, we got to clean up these rooms downstairs. So September 11th plan, we're going to need a lot of help, right, Ann? Boxes, empty boxes. Yeah. <laughs> empty boxes. <laughs> and then way into October, we will be holding something we've looked forward to for quite a while since pandemic anyway. Our first really big deal here, the harvest banquet and auction. Uh, we're going to be having that. And uh, we welcome the Wikis to us this morning. They, they boast... They have the uh, unique privilege of having had the largest wedding here ever. Uh, good, to, good to have you here. So anyway, downstairs we have some uh, frozen donuts, rolls, right? And the, Carol wants to get rid of them. And, and uh, warning, if she won't eat them, there's something wrong. So. <laughs> I better stop talking right now. <laughs> anyway, we're glad you're here. Those are the announcements. We're going to worship the Lord together and lift up His name as we worship. Thank you for coming. Walk across the aisle. Greet one another in the name of the Lord, and then Tim will come and lead us in worship. <laughs>
bet you can. Interestingly enough, a little boy was innocently talking to the arrogant pastor. Said, today my dad taught me all about Babylon. I said, really? Replied the pastor. How did he explain Babylon? He said, because that's what you do every Sunday morning. <laughs> I just read it. I didn't make that up. All right. You've, some of you have heard this before. I'm going to read it again anyway. Once there were three trees on a hill in the woods. They were discussing their hopes and dreams, and the first tree said, Someday I hope to be a treasure chest. I could be filled with gold, silver, and precious gems, and I could be decorated with intricate carving, and everyone would see my beauty. Then the second tree said, Someday I will be a mighty ship. I will take kings and queens across the waters and sail to the corners of the world. Everyone will feel safe in me because of the strength of my hull. Finally, the third tree said, I want to grow to be the tallest and straight, straightest tree in the forest. People will see me on top of the hill and look at my branches and think of the heavens and God and how close to them I am reaching. I will be the greatest tree of all time and people will always remember me. After a few years of praying that their dreams would come true, a group of woodsmen came upon the trees. When one came to the first tree, he said, this looks like a strong tree. I think I shall be able to sell the wood to a carpenter and he began cutting it down. The tree was happy because he knew the carpenter would make him into a treasure chest. At, at that, the second tree, at the second tree, the woodsman said, this looks like a strong tree. I should be able to sell it to the shipyard. The second tree was happy because he was on his way to becoming a mighty ship. When the woodsman came upon the third tree, he was frightened because he knew if they cut down this tree, he, if he cut down, the tree was frightened because he knew that if they cut him down, his dreams would not come true. One of the woodsmen said, I don't need anything special from my tree, so I'll take this one. Then he cut it down. When the first tree arrived at the carpenters, he was made into a feed box for animals. He was then placed in a barn and filled with hay. This was not at all what he had prayed for. The second tree was cut and made into a small fishing boat. His dreams of being a mighty ship and carrying kings had come to an end. The third tree was cut into large pieces and left alone in the dark. The years went by and the trees forgot about their dreams. Then one day a man and a woman came, came to the barn. She gave birth, birth and placed the baby in the hay in the feed box that was made from the first tree. The man wished that he could have made a crib for his baby, for the baby, but this manger will have to do. The tree could feel the importance of this event and knew that it held the greatest treasure of all time. Years later, a group of men in a fishing boat made from the second tree. One of them was tired and went to sleep. While they were out on the water, a great storm arose, and the tree didn't think it was strong enough to keep the men safe. The men woke this meat sleeping man, and he stood and said, Peace, and the storm stopped. At this time, the tree knew that he had carried the king of all kings on his boat. Finally, someone came and got the third tree was carried through the streets as the people mocked the man who was carrying it. When they came to a stop, the man was nailed to that tree and raised in the air to die on the top of the hill. When Sunday came, the tree came to realize that he, it was strong enough to stand on the top of the hill and be as close to God as was possible because Jesus had been crucified on it. The moral of this story is that when things don't seem to be going your way, always know that God has a plan for you. If you place your trust in Him, He will give you great gifts. Each of these trees got what they wanted, just not the way they had imagined. We don't always know what God's plan is for us. We just know that His ways are not ours, but His are always best. So I share that with you. And while I'm still reeling from last week, and I have to read that to myself, because I just spent a lot of money on a car that's not worth four grand. So... I have Subaru for sale. All right. <clears throat> Talk to me about the pricing later. It's worth more than you. Be quiet. I, you know nothing from the peanut gallery. You're not in line to buy it because you can't afford it neither. <laughs> anyway, just to share that with you that we should all we should all be looking to God for His will and not the things that we think we need because we're always disappointed, are we not? Generally, you know, if we don't look to Him. So with that being said, let's come into his presence. Stand up and let's sing to him.
any any of the faculties except uh, she has a, a very bad virus infection, and they're treating that uh, bacterial infection. They're treating with antibiotics, and uh, she is recovering well. So we praise for that. Pray for Ray. Uh, he is he's 90, 91 years old, and he's trying to take care of her take care of himself. So pray for Ray and his strength. Other than the list here, are there any other requests that we need to pray for in this school? Elaine? I would like her to gain weight. Elaine needs to gain weight. I have some if you'd like it. <laughs> yeah. There's donuts downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> but they're frozen. <laughs> Joyce? Joyce? Sandy? So that'll make you a great. No, that's still a great. That's still a great. <laughs> well, you're pretty good. I'm already a great. She was a good grandma, now she's really great. And I have twins. Yes. Okay. Praise the Lord. Any others? Well, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege of being here today. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to worship freely, without fear. We thank you, Father, for this great nation, the privilege we have and the freedoms we enjoy because of our servicemen and women, both active and reservist. We ask, Lord, that you would protect them they're abroad or someplace else, not home, bring them home safely. Father, we are grateful that you hear and answer our prayers. And I'm aware that as you walk through the, this group, walk through the doors this morning, each of us bring with us a backstory, a worry, a problem. Troubles in home lives and family lives and professional lives and just all sorts of decisions. And we just ask you would meet those needs, even as we've asked you to meet with us this morning, as we worship you, sing these wonderful songs about your majesty and glory. We would hold before you, uh, Elaine, that she would be able to gain weight and get back her strength. For Diane and the brain surgery that uh, she has had, and Father, we pray that her recovery would be quick and complete. She would be strong and whole again. And we thank you for the potential and the opportunity for the twins to be born, bringing new life, mir the miracle of life in, into this world. We pray for mom and, and the babies as they develop, that uh, they would be perfect in every respect. They would be raised up to be men or women of, of purpose, honor that would bring glory to your name. We commit this service, these your people, and your word to our hearts today. Change our hearts that we might be like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, I wasn't here last week. You took an offering last week? So we're doing that again now. The plates aren't front and back. Obviously, they're right here. I need some volunteers to help pass the hat. You got it? Well, come on up. Let's see. I don't know about that. And uh, we will be honored, I think, with the children and signing right now. Let's get the children up here, too. The guys that have learned some sign language that might do. our offerings, and for many sacrifice, and multiply them in your service for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
chapter 12 through 21 so I will always remind you of these things even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know that I will put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me and I will make every effort to see that after my departure you will always be able to remember these things. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His Majesty, for He received glory and honor from God the Father 
when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from the heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but, God, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Diane. Appreciate that so much. Wonderful, wonderful scripture that we get to read and have. You see the children have left, so we'd like you to stand now just before the message. And sing with me, Jesus Loves Even Me.
five first five books. And uh, Israel has, from we, we begin the process in Genesis and Exodus, the people of Israel uh, have come out of Egypt and they have seen God do wonderful miracles. I mean, they literally have seen the powerful hand of God in their life, working miracles for them. They've traveled for 40 years in the wilderness. In fact, most of them who left Egypt, in fact, all of them who left Egypt are dead now. And so what uh, Moses is about, he never got to lead them into the promised land because that was left to Joshua. But he's he, writing the last book, he, he begins to say some things. He says, be careful in the first, in Deuteronomy, you don't have to turn to Deuteronomy 8, I'm going to summarize it for you. In Deuteronomy 8, 1, he says, be careful to follow every command. And then in verse 2, he says, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble and test you or try you. And then he goes on down and he says that word again. In verse 15, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so on. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and bow down to them, I will testify against you and you will surely be destroyed. He no longer had before him the eyewitnesses Understand that. The eyewitnesses that, that watched the Red Sea part. The witnesses that saw water come out of a rock. The witnesses that at the Red Sea saw Pharaoh's army totally, totally destroyed. The eyewitnesses were dead because they forgot. So now he's talking to the second generation. Not the great grandkids, the grandkids. And, and they, they are there, and he says, Folks, I want you to read your history book. Remember what I did for you. We quite often talk about faith, and I've always asked people here, well, What's faith? And you say, Well, it's trust, it's belief, it's all, all things. Hebrews tells us in chapter 11, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Substance. That's, you can touch it, you can feel it, you can see it, you can hear it. Substance. And it is the evidence of things not seen. People look at Christians today and they say, oh, you bunch of, believe in a bunch of fairy tales and ghost stories and all the other stuff. No, 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 that's not true. If we remember our history, these things were witnessed, eyewitness accounts. But now, he says, you have to trust your history. You have to read your history book. And so, it, it, he, he is very clear. In fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy alone, the word remember, just that one word, is used over 16 times in 33 chapters. Now, to me, I like little details like that. Uh, and some people don't care how many times it's mentioned. But it must be important for God to tell us to remember. I went to seminary, and uh, 7 o'clock class was ancient history. It's where I got my best sleep. <laughs> and and I, I, I can remember the, the uh, teacher was Dr. McIntyre. He was dry as a bone, and I slept through it. Seven o'clock in the morning, who can get up and go to class? I wish I hadn't. I need to know the history, the eyewitness accounts of what God did and does. So I submit to you that history is by far the most important. But what should we remember? So I want you to go, if this is out of order, I should have changed it, but uh, let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1, our text today. 2 Peter chapter 1. And it's easy to remember things when, when uh, we put them in some alliterative, they tell us we should use alliteration uh, to, to remember things. How's your memory? 
Uh, how many learned to re how many can read music? You, you can read music. And how did you learn the notes? Every good boy does fine. E G B D F. That's on the school. Or face. There's an acronym for that in, uh, in the treble class. So what we're I don't know what that is. So I. <laughs> I didn't listen all that well in, in music either. Uh, what are we saying? It's easy to remember stuff if we can put it to rhyme and so on. And so God does that. So the reason for this message, there are four R's this morning that I want to, that Peter says we need to remember. If you remember, he, he told us uh, in, in here, he says, I'm about to die. And uh, Peter at the end of his life, very much like Moses at the end of his life, is telling the church, remember. So the first thing he said, the first one is the reception. Notice in verse 1 of the, we didn't read this as part of our text, but it says those who through the righteousness of God and, uh, and our Savior Jesus Christ has received a faith. You know your faith is a gift. God has given us a wonderful job and he's a wonderful uh, uh, salvation, but you have to receive it. It was a gift to you, this gift of faith as a precious stone, something more precious than anything. But I want to get to the second R, which is really in, in verse, verse 12. He says, so I will always remind you of these precious evidences. Now from verse 12, you have to back up to the context before it. And that is, for this reason in verse 5 or 6, verse 5, I guess, make every effort to add to that gift. Most of us that call ourselves Christians, adults now, uh, think of, of uh, a point in time when we received Jesus as our Savior. You recall that day when you invited Him to come into your heart and save you from your sin. You may, you may identify it with a baptism or some other uh, tradition or cultural significance, but you remember. Well, He says, I want to remind you of these things. And He says, this is what, for this reason, make every, every effort to add to your faith it just doesn't happen that you become a good person because you said a magical prayer. Now our prayer is based on faith. It's a gift from God. He's given us the ability to receive His Savior because it's a gift, but you have to accept it. Most of us have given hundreds of gifts to our family and friends and, and, and uh, at Christmas time especially we unwrap them. <clears throat> and how do you feel? If you gave a gift and the person looks at it and says, I don't want that, and ignored it. Well, hundreds of millions and billions of people have ignored the gift of faith. They've not received it. But those of us that have, he says, here's what we're supposed to do with it. He said, add to your faith. Look at this goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness. Hmm. He says, now if you have these things, you'll be profitable. But he goes on to say, says, but if anyone doesn't have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Don't you wish that being a Christian, God would have made you perfect the minute you trusted him? Never sin again? Well, that didn't happen. There is an expectation of the believers that we would be good. Be good. How many times have I said that to Tim? Be good. <laughs> Remember your history. Uh, I, what, what we're pointing out, folks, is God expects us to be good. Not just, not just average. Be good. We have to add goodness. What's the, what's the golden rule? Tell me, what's the golden rule that you know from Scripture? 
do, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. What does that mean? Well, I'll wait for them to do something to me, then I'll do something to them. No, it starts with us. We're going to have to add goodness. What would you like somebody to do you, for you or to you today? Then do it to them first. Well, there's a novel thought. In other words, service. Service. Guys, this is for you. What does your wife want? Come on. What does your wife want? Don't all shout at once. Love and respect. Okay. She wants to feel loved. And she wants to feel secure. And she wants to feel with those two important. So how can you make your wife feel important today? Don't answer that. <laughs> Listen to her. Listen to her. Okay, I know she would like me to clean the kitchen. And then she's going to re-clean it because I don't put stuff where it's supposed to. See, folks, this, this adding goodness is not a hard thing. But we usually ignore it. We need to be reminded. And so in verse 12, he says, I want to remind you of those things so that you will remember them. And then he uses the word refresh. Refresh our memories as long as we live in this body. And then Peter says, I know I'm going to die, but I have to refresh your memory. That's why history is so important. What has God done? And on the other hand, please remember once in a while, I do something good. Because this goes both ways. This is, this is not a marriage uh, message, but it's important for us to understand the importance of what we remember. It's a real simple, and God has given us this wonderful ability to remember. And uh, this year has been a busy year for, for most pastors in our community because it seems like people are dying like flies. And we're doing lots of, of, of funerals. And, and we, we tell people, to, God gives us a wonderful ability to remember. I want you to remember the wonderful memories that you have of your family, your loved one, your relation, whatever it was. Remember them. And you say, well, my memory isn't any good. Well, that's, that means we remember what is important give you an illustration. I have a grandson who loves football. Always has. Loves football. Wasn't very big. He is now, but he wasn't very big. But I tell you what, he could tell you any, when, when he was that high, now he's this high, he was that high, he could give you a statistic about any quarterback, any tackle, any end, on any team, college or pro, and talk incessantly about their strength. And you know why? He was interested. We learn and we do what we're interested in. And so he can remember those things and he remembers because he's interested in it. But God also has given us a forgetter. And I simply ask every lady, how many of you have had more than one child? Why? <laughs> Because you forgot the memory. You forgot the pain. You forgot the nine, nine months of carrying that child and, and feeling like, the, I don't know what you feel like. I've never been there. Uh, and I'm not going there either. Uh, you forgot labor. And God allows us to forget so that you will remember the good. And he said, I want to refresh you because Peter says, I'm going to die and I'm not going to be here. But he goes on, he says, these aren't cleverly things. I'm not telling you things that were cleverly invented down in the next verse. He says, I was an eyewitness to Jesus. The story that Tim read before uh, in, in the what we, meet and greet time, uh, the story he read, about the trees wanting something. I don't know if that's if they did all the memory, but what we remember, and it's important this that Peter saw Jesus walk on water. Peter even walked on water, and and then he looked down and he started to sink. He looked back up, and Jesus grabbed him. He remembered he was an eyewitness. He was eyewitness. 
to the cross. He was an eyewitness to the resurrection. And he says, I'm telling you this, and you must remember. There's something else you have to remember because of the things we're talking about. And that's Revelation. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And down in verses 19 and 20, he tells us that no scripture is of any private interpretation. But holy men of God spoke as they were born along and moved by the Holy Spirit. And he, and he says, says that, that this word is our memories have to look at the eyewitness which is recorded in the word so vital to us that, that, that we want to grow, we want to add goodness, but I, I, I use it a lot, you've heard me say it, the WWJD bracelet, most people who wore them had no idea who Jesus was, let alone what he would do. And that can't be true of us. Because we are told to remember what God, what God has done for us. And that leads us to 2 Timothy chapter 3, or chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. And here's the three things you need to remember today. The first thing as we go through life, we have to remember God's Son. What a simple thing. Verse 8, it says, remember Jesus Christ. How often do you think about We hear his name a lot. You go to any shop, any locker room, any athletic event, any business event, somewhere you're going to hear somebody use that name in an accursed fashion. What do you remember about Jesus? What do you remember about him? Do you remember that he loves me? Uh, Travis and Linda Luss, Travis's mother-in-law and Linda's mother, we do. And one of our memories is Marilyn's memory, singing with Grandma just days before, Jesus loves me as I do. For the Bible tells me so. You want to feel important? Men or women, remember Jesus loves you. Doesn't that flow easily? Well, how do I know he loved me? Because you didn't remember your history. You don't remember your history. What were you before Jesus saved you? Where is your security? Do you understand who Jesus is? The Son of God. God himself. God in the flesh. He gave himself to be a servant. Do you remember that Jesus was a servant? We always think of him as our Savior. That's true. But his history, he served. He served. That's what he came. In fact, the Apostle Peter, excuse me, the Apostle Paul, in, in, in his words, tells us that Jesus gave up his right to be right. Think about that. You want to be like Jesus? Give up your right to be right. The same Jesus. He says, let this mind be in you. He says, he became a servant, was found, found made in the fashion of a servant. Now, we always look to the Savior. That's true. That's wonderful, and that's a wonderful memory. But do you understand that Jesus came to serve you? In fact, today, he ever lives to make intercession for you. Is that part of your memory? Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Remember God's Son. But we also have to remember God's Word. He talks about this in, the, in, in that very context in, in the, uh, 2 Timothy, in verse 8. He says, for this is my gospel. Now, Paul, like Peter, was an eyewitness. And he says, this is my gospel, which is his word. If God says it with the identity of serving you, then we have to understand 
what does his word and his word remember? How many have you ever been in a Bible memory course? Okay. How many verses can you quote? My dad got saved when I was a kid. Little kid. I mean, small kid. When he died, he could still quote for you the entire book of Romans and all of Hebrews. Dr. Jack Van Impey, one of the famous evangelists of a few years back, he's still alive, still preaching, uh, but uh, he memorized the entire Bible. Don't ever try to have an argument with that man. <laughs> Folks, it's important we remember his word. Why don't you start with Romans, not the book. That's a pretty ambitious task. How about Romans 3.23? Romans 6.23? Romans 5.8 and 9? Romans 10, 9 and 10. How about that? You've just learned the plan of salvation. If somebody says, well, how do I, how do I, how do I ever know I can go to heaven? Ah, you've got the Romans road you just memorized. Is that seven, eight, nine verses? Most of you can quote John 3, 16. Many of you can quote Psalm 23, or all the verses, and do it quite accurately. It doesn't matter what version. What he's saying, he tells these people, remember Jesus, gospel of the word. What is the gospel? Jesus died. Jesus was buried. Jesus rose again. And he's coming again. First Corinthians, he tells us in chapter 15, that's the gospel. Remember it. Jesus loves you. So we remember God's Son, God's Word, and God's people. God's people. What do you mean by God's people? It's important to gather with God's people. It's important to pray for God's people. Now, he tells us that. Paul tells us in, in Romans. He tells us here. To remember, he, says, he goes on. He says, I'm suffering and so on. And in verse 10, therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. That's God's people. Now, in the Old Testament, the elect would have the connotation of Israel. In the New Testament, the elect has the connotation of the church as we know it today. Here to remember. How do you remember God's people? How do you remember your family here? I know we got a prayer list. Good prayer list. Long prayer list. How many actually pray for this list? Every day? Some do. That's wonderful. But if, if, if we're going to learn anything from today about memory, we have to remember God's Son, God's Word, and God's people. And how do you how do you know how to pray? Well, the reason I know about Pat is because I visit him. Now, with the pandemic, it's been very hard to visit people. But we all have phones. Hey, I was thinking of you today. Can I pray for you? Paul, Pastor, you expect me to do that? I'm not that kind of person. Huh. Maybe you ought to understand history. We learn from history. Now, I had a history teacher in high school that taught me and said, the only thing that history teaches us is that history teaches us nothing because we keep repeating it. And it's, uh, life is like that and because it doesn't teach us anything if we don't learn from it. But the way, easiest way to learn from it is to live it. We, are, we didn't see the risen Savior. We, we, we haven't seen it. But we have his word. He lived it. We didn't see the apostles suffer and die and be martyred. But we have history that tells us. In fact, they actually asked Peter before they martyred him, how did he want to die? He had lots of choices. The most grueling, and what, what Jesus said, I Peter said, I, I really want to die like Christ, but I'm not, I'm not worthy of that. So they put him on a cross and hung him upside down. Did you know that? 
Margaret Thatcher. History. It's important. Our memories play the single most important role in our spiritual development. History. Your memory is important. And so I ask you this morning, what do you remember? You remember God's Son? You remember His Word? Do you remember His work or His people? Do we remember the reception of the gift of faith? It's a gift to be developed. So with that we add goodness brotherly love and kindness and self-control and perseverance. For years I thought, well, that's the fruit of the Spirit and that's the, fruit, the Spirit's job to do that. Nope. The Spirit does it by use of your memory. I had a friend in college that never studied, never studied. We were cramming for exams and he said, well, if the Lord wants me to pass, he'll just give me a spirit and, and uh, I'll get this test right. Well, he flunked out. Name, his name was Bob. Flunked out of school. Never studied a little bit. And he said, well, the Spirit, he said, the Spirit let me down. <laughs> no, the Spirit. He didn't add to his faith goodness. Brotherly kindness. We have to add those things. It's our job. It's what God expects us to do with our memory. What do you remember? Father God, we come to you and we submit to you our minds. We want to have the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus, and who became in the form of a servant to express your love to us. So we give ourselves to you today. We commit our memory to you that we would remember your Son, your Word, Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we close, let's stand as we sing, Your Love Compels Me.